<laughs> because we know, because someone told us from their atomic phone that it's 7 o'clock at Samantha Place, another incredible Sunday night. Woo! I said, time to go. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, we know. Um, <laughs> here we go again. Here we go again. Uh, if you don't know us, we have Tom, Lisa, man. We are from Calvary Baptist Church and Heavy Deep and Real Ministries. If it's your first time here, buckle up. Um, if you've been here before with us, you know. So uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about forgiveness, and I'm going to kind of give you a, uh, I'm going to give you a different twist on it that maybe you've heard before. So that'll be fun for me. Aha! Hopefully for you as well. But let's start with prayer as we always do, okay? Father, thanks for this time. Thanks for these wonderful, wonderful people, Lord, that you have blessed, that you are uh, giving uh, instruction to, and you're giving respite to, and you're growing, and uh, just doing all the things you're doing in their lives, Lord. We ask that um, all of us would have soft enough hearts to uh, listen to you and what you have for us tonight that it would grow us, that it would uh, help us in some areas in our life that uh, maybe are a little rough right now, or maybe uh, just your words through my lips, and just have the Holy Spirit move powerfully in what we do tonight. We pray us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All righty. So there's a scene in the Bible in Matthew 18 where Peter has just listened to Jesus talk about this concept of forgiveness. And it starts out with dealing with a sinning brother. So if you look at Matthew 18, starting at verse 15, this one I'll need my glasses for. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Make two or more people with you. And you kind of confront him on it. You don't allow someone just to, to not do that. Uh, so he's telling you this, this forgiveness thing is important. So Peter's heard this whole thing. And he comes to Jesus after this, this teaching and says, Jesus, how many times do I got to forgive my brother? Seven times? Well, the context of this is great. Because in the way Judaism worked back then, the, the rabbis would tell you you need to forgive someone three times. The, the rule was three. And so if someone does something, so you three times. And the fourth time, cut them off. That was the rabbinical rule. So when Peter said seven times, he was going above and beyond. Now in Hebrew numerology, seven is the perfect number. And so Peter was thinking he was doing absolutely the right thing by saying seven times. He was meaning that, that you know, it's more than even the, the temple tells us to do. And look, seven's a perfect number. So if I do it seven times, he does it the eighth time, he's over. And Jesus says, mm, Peter, seven times 70, seven times 70, 400, which meant every time. So he was taking the perfect number of seven, multiplying it by 70, adding zeros to it. And you can just imagine Peter just shaking his head, go, are you kidding me? Right? And, and it's a great learning because forgiveness is the foundation of our faith. The whole idea that Jesus came and died on a cross for our sins, he died for the forgiveness of sins. He's forgiving us. We are reconciled to God. We are made holy and perfect in his sight. Every, you know, this is the whole idea of, of our faith is forgiveness that we needed a way to be forgiven by God for our rebellion and our, you know, being dumb and all the stuff that we do. And Jesus paid that path. But we have a hard time with forgiveness. And there's a reason I'm going to go into in a minute. But let me tell you what Scripture says. In Matthew 6, 14, 15 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. So do mind you if you're not forgiving people. Um, Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us or trespass against us or our debts, whichever version you like. So even when Jesus was saying, this is how we pray, you gotta, you got to forgive. It goes into uh, uh, Luke 23 through uh, 23, 34. He's on the cross. And they've just, they've just nailed him. And, and you know what you've seen on the crucifix where his feet are like this? That's not how they did it. They did it through a nerve on the heel yeah. that was very torturous. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He's forgiving people that are killing him. I mean, that is this, the amazing thing about the forgiveness of Jesus. And we know this from, from when we do communion, that in Matthew 26, 28, says, For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So this forgiveness idea is really foundational to the Christian belief that we are sinners in need of a Savior so that we can be forgiven our sins and be reconciled to God and be seen holy and righteous in His sight so that we have eternity with 
with God. Jesus loves you so much that he came and suffered for you individually because he wants to spend eternity with you. So cool. But here on earth, meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, forgiveness is hard. And I, I've had a lot of people abuse me in my life. And when I was wrestling with this forgiveness thing, I know what scripture says. It's a command. Forgive or you won't be forgiven. But that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> it seems like people get away with it. Right? You forgive people and it's like, they just, they just get completely away with whatever they did to you. And so I had to do a lot of study on this. And there's three points I want to make tonight about forgiveness that may help you if you were like me in this position. There's a formula to forgiveness, right? It's not just simply forgiving someone and moving on and, oh my goodness, happy-go-lucky. You know, this ain't Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here's the formula. Forgiveness equals resolution plus justice. He agrees. Resolution plus justice. So what do I mean by that? So when someone has done us wrong, and we need to do forgiveness because we have to, there's two components that always seem to be the sticking points. The issue is not resolved, and it just seems like someone gets away with it. We just can't have that, right? And so how we, how we get to this is let me deal with resolution, and then let me deal with justice. Resolution is, in your mind, how you take a situation and get to a place where you can go, okay, that's the way it is. And not be chewing on it night after night, not be having it just tear you up, not, you know, play, you have to do this, you play out the scenario in your head, and you say, well, I would have said this, and they would have said that. And, you know, resolution is saying, that's that. So I'll give you an example. My dad was a, a, a horrible individual, and uh, um, charismatic as, as heck. I love my dad, but he was, he was not a good man. And he caused my sisters and I a ton of trouble and pain in our lives because of his narcissistic stuff and all the stuff he did. So one night I'm out with him, and I'm, I, I took him out for drinks. He was a functional alcoholic. He was a fifth of scotch guy, a fifth of night. And uh, so I brought him out to a bar. And I was going to finally confront him. I was like 23 years old. and say, okay, Dad, are you going to take any responsibility for the dumb stuff you did? And he wouldn't. He just was absolutely not going to take responsibility for um, some sexual abuse things he did to my sisters, for all the abuse, all the stuff. Just wouldn't do it. Putting, being in jail, putting us in foster homes, having us be homeless, all the stuff. He would not take any responsibility. Now, you would think that would be a problem for me, right? Because I'm a high accountability guy. But I realized that night as I was driving home, that's resolution. He's never going to change. He's always going to be that guy. He's never going to take accountability. He'll never be responsible. He'll never say, I'm sorry. He'll never. And for me, that resolved the issue because I knew what I was dealing with. Now, did it resolve the way I wanted it to? Heck no. I wanted him to, you know, confess up that, yeah, I was an idiot, but he wouldn't do it. But that resolution helped a lot because I was able then to go, well, this is now going to be my relationship with this person. And he lived another 17 years, and we had a, a relationship. But it, there were boundaries, because I was resolved in this relationship, what I was going to look like. Sometimes we have these problems with people that have done us wrong, and there's no resolution because we can't grasp how this thing really is, how these people really are. I, I deal with a lot of kids at Corbin University, and God bless them. They grow up, and they're homeschooled, and they're kind of deer in the headlights a lot of times. And they get the part that scripture says about being as gentle as a dove, but they miss the part about being wise as a serpent. And they always assume the best of people, which is great, but then they get their hearts broken because people suck. And so, well, that's true. You know, we're all evil. We all do evil. We're all selfish. We all fall short of the glory of God. Not one of us is righteous. And so people, you got to have your eyes open a little bit. So there can be things in your life where there have been people who have done harm to you and it's not resolved in your head. And how you get to resolution is kind of accepting that people are people. People are exactly what this book says they are. They're sinners in need of a Savior. 
And so sometimes you come to resolution by saying, you know what, this person did wrong, this person did evil, this person's a sinner, this person did whatever it is. And I need to forgive them, but I have to understand that they did so out of their sinful nature. And I get that because I'm sinful. I do dumb things too. And so I can give them a little bit of quarter because I have resolution that they are what they are. Now, do we want people to get better? Absolutely. Do you want to be a person that helps them get better? Absolutely. Is that always appropriate? No. Not always appropriate. Not always safe. Not always right. Sometimes you just got to leave people to their own devices. And here's the story. Remember in 1 Corinthians when uh, Paul is giving them a hard time because the dude is uh, sleeping with his with his mother, his stepmother? And he's like, even the pagans don't do this. What are you doing? And he says, throw him out of the church. If you won't repent, throw him out of the church and let Satan have him for a while. And then when he gets comes to his senses and repents, bring him back. Sometimes we just got to give people to Satan and let them have their way until they come to their senses. Hopefully they do. And then we can bring them back in. But some people don't come to their senses, do they? My dad didn't. He didn't come to his senses. And um, that's just the way it was. And I had resolution. So if you're thinking in your life, someone's done me wrong, and I, I, I have to forgive this person, but I'm still chewing on it, that first part is resolving who that person really is and accepting that the person is what they are. They're exactly what Scripture says they are. There's not anybody in this world who is not described in this book. Everybody that has a personality is in this book. And so that's the first part, is resolving that. The second part, though, is the justice piece, and this is so important. What got me over the hump was realizing that everyone is going to meet Jesus, and they're going to get what they earned. Not what they deserve, but they earned. Right? So... We know from 1 Corinthians, I think it's 3, I could be wrong. Um, it says that your works are going to be put to the test by fire. And that hay and, and wood and stubble are going to burn up. And you're going to get into heaven if you're a believer, but by the skin of your teeth with your pants on fire. If you're not a believer, everything's going to burn up. You've got nothing. Right? And you're going to be judged on your own righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ. However, if you do good works for the Lord and all that kind of stuff, and your motive's right, and you're doing good stuff, then you have jewels that come out of this, and you get to give them to Jesus, yay, happy, happy. And when I was reading that, I was like, you know what? This guy that abused me, he's going to have in front of Jesus. And no matter what revenge fantasy I have in my head, God's justice will be more perfect than anything I could do. God's justice will be perfect. For me, too, right? I've done people wrong. i got 40 years of it. That first 40 years when we go through life together, Jesus and I say, let's sit down and talk about your life, Tom. <laughs> first 40 years is going to be rough. <laughs> it's going to be rough. So I don't have much. It's all going to burn up. And Jesus is going to say to me, dude, you, you could have had, had blessings. You could have had jewels. You could have had, but you don't because you screwed it up. And you know how I'm going to feel when that happens? Two ways. One, you're right. Two, that's going to be a sad moment. Right? So even believers get held to account. Even believers. I heard this one guy that was a foster dad who was this violent, drunken alcoholic who used to beat his wife and do so horrible things. I heard later in life he came to the faith. I hope he did. But he's not getting away with what he did to me. He's not getting away with what he did to his other kids and his wife. He's being held to account. And no matter how much in my mind I think about what I would want to do to that guy if I met him, forgive me, Lord, I know that God's justice is perfect. And so when I have to forgive him, which I have, I have to say I'm resolved that he was a violent alcoholic who couldn't control himself and was an instant a-hole just add liquor. And God's justice to him will be served. And then I can go, you know what? I don't have to own this anymore. I don't have to own the revenge. I don't have to own the hate. I don't have to own any of it because God's got this. So the first part of forgiveness is understanding who God is. God is the judge, not me. God is the justice, not me. God sees everything, everyone's motive. He says he looks in your heart, sees these things. And so nobody's going to do anything to you 
and walk away scot-free. Now, here's the beautiful part about that in our faith. People are like, I'm an atheist. I'm like, does Hitler get away with it then? Does Idi Amin get away with it? I mean, come on, think about this for a second. That just doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. We can't, we can't have people just going that crap crazy out there and getting away with stuff. There's got to be some accountability. We feel it in our, in our very soul. We feel there's got to be accountability, which is why it's so hard to forgive, because where's the accountability? Right? But there is. And that's a beautiful thing about our faith, is we can rely on that as the first step of forgiveness. The first point. But there's a second and third point, because I wouldn't want to leave you hanging. Second point. <laughs> Here's the point. Forgiveness is not between you and me. Forgiveness is between God and I. See, all the time when we think about forgiveness, we think it's between the two people. But it's not. See, God's command is to forgive. And sometimes you forgive out of obedience because God commands you to do it. And you, you go, but that's not fair or it doesn't feel right, right? But that's not the point. It's not between you and me. It's between God and I. I'm being obedient to what God says to do. I'm doing what God told me to. And so God can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now here's, the, here's my little story. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Tom. And he, he was an arrogant jerk. And he suffered from a lot of PTSD. Uh, and he treated people badly. Badly. And then Tom came to the faith, and God convicted him seriously and said, you need to apologize for all the crap you did. I apologize. He's not good enough. You need to write letters to people. Make a list. So I made a list. There were ten people I had to apologize to. And ask forgiveness, because I really... I really screwed him over. So I wrote these letters. Sent them out. You know how many I heard back from? One. Okay. And um, what I realized in that moment was forgiveness is between me and God. I did exactly what God told me to do. I humbled myself. I took accountability. I took responsibility. I asked for forgiveness. But then it's out of my hands. I'm not responsible anymore. I did what I'm supposed to do. If that person can forgive, fantastic. But that's between them and God. If they don't forgive me, I, I pray for them. Because it's a hard thing to live with unforgiveness. But see how that worked? It wasn't about that other person. Yeah, I wanted to make amends. Because you feel bad. You, know, uh, you realize things. But your forgiveness is God and you. And God saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You don't worry about them anymore. You let me worry about them and their unforgiveness, because that's between me and them. Because again, he's the judge, not us. So that second point is, in forgiveness, we, we understand there's resolution plus justice, and then understanding that forgiveness isn't about two people, it's about God and you. You're doing what God calls you to. Which is why Jesus can be on a cross and say, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. He's forgiving them for killing him, which is out, just outrageous. It turns the whole thing on its head. But what he's doing is he's being obedient to the Father in this forgiveness piece, which is really important. And here's the third point. There are four areas, four areas of forgiveness, and I want to go through them. Uh, and I want to give you examples if I can come up with it in my little pea brain. First, you, you have to seek forgiveness. Uh, you have to forgive the person who wronged you. Then you've got to... Seek forgiveness from the people you wronged. And you got to forgive God. And then you got to forgive yourself. And it's that fourth one you all trip over. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go through this. So if we have to have forgiveness equals resolution and justice, you obviously we talked about when someone does you wrong, we have to recognize their condition and their personhood and, and the personality and whether there's any room for growth or any of that kind of stuff. And forgive them by resolving... This is this person. And then saying, God's justice is perfect. I, I can give this up to God. I don't have to be the one making justice. He is. Seeking forgiveness from another person, though, when you've been the, the wrong party, first you have to recognize you did wrong. And that's really hard. It's really hard to admit, I screwed up. Right? But God calls us to that. You're supposed to go to your brother before you have, have your gift at the altar if he has something against you. God takes forgiveness so seriously. He doesn't even want your gift before you go to the person who has something against you and you go make it right. You go reconcile, it says, with your brother. 
So sometimes we have to make a list and say, okay, if I'm just being honest with myself, who did I not treat very well? What did I do where I could use, I need to seek forgiveness? Now again, only when it's appropriate, but it should be done, or it's an anchor that's, that's tying you down. And again, think about resolution and justice. It resolves itself because you've done what God's called you to do. You've obeyed. And the justice is you're not going to reap God's unforgiveness because you were prideful and stood your ground and didn't want to you know, admit your fault. And it takes a lot of humility to ask someone for forgiveness because we can justify any of our actions, can't we? I can justify just about anything I do. There's probably a verse in the Bible for everything I do that I could say, oh, look at this verse. That's not true. So we have to go to that person, seek forgiveness. And again, recognize that when I write the letter or talk to the person, whatever, it's not between them and me necessarily. It's between me and God. God is calling me to do this. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because it's important that I do this because he wants the best for me. And the best thing for me is to get this out of me. This third one's tough. Forgive God. And you're like, forgive God? God's God. We don't forgive him. How many of you have ever been mad at God? Yeah. And God knows that. He's got big shoulders. He can handle it. Um, I used to think growing up, here's my theology. So I grew up in, uh, I grew up in an assembly of God. My dad was a Jew, but he was an atheist. My mom was a Catholic who got excommunicated because she married a Jew. She became what we call Catholic light, a Lutheran. So I was a baptized Lutheran as a little baby. Dunk. Um, then I was in, uh, uh, assembly of God home which is a little charismatic. I, I swear to goodness, we went to church six days a week and the pastor came over for dinner on the 7th. Uh, it was it was a heavy-duty stuff. And then I was in a Baptist home. I was in a Catholic home, went through all the Catholic training and was about to get con- go to confession and I called the nun over and said, I can't do this. She goes, why not? You're, you're a great student. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm a baptized Lutheran. Turns out nuns do not have a sense of humor. And I was pulled out of the line and... I'm not allowed to go back to the Catholic Church. <laughs> I said, I'm a foster kid. What do you want from me? Uh, uh, and so I was at four square churches. You know, I've been, I had a lot of church. A lot of church. And what I learned growing up was God separates the silver from the dross. And you have to prove your worth to him to be worthy of his love. And you gotta, you got to gotta fight, right? And so my relationship with God for my first 23 years... 24 years, was you knock me down, I'll get up. No matter how many times you knock me down, I'll get up. I will fight you to the end. Love, Tom. (laughs) Because that's how I thought it worked. And my theology was way wrong. That's a whole different story. But I had to forgive God for where were you when I was getting beaten? Where were you when I didn't have food? Where were you when I didn't have a place to live? Where were you when my mom was paralyzed with multiple sclerosis? Where were you? When my sisters were uh, separate, where were you when I was abandoned? Where were? You? There's a lot of where were you questions. Right? If God is sovereign, why didn't He intervene? Th- these are hard questions, right? So sometimes you need to go to God and find resolution <laughs> and reconcile and and learn God was there. Yeah, he was. He was there. And but you got to wrestle with Him. You got to wrestle with Him, and it's okay to wrestle with God. But you got to get to a place of forgiving him and understanding what, where he was in the midst of all this trouble to get to a place of forgiveness so you're not angry at him. And that's a lot harder than it sounds. And this last one's, this one's the doozy. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. And I'm going to tell you the, the trick to this one. Think of something you did that was stupid. All right, enough time. I know you all went. I saw the thought bubbles. It was really cool. Uh, were you the same person then as you are now? No. Do you have a lot more knowledge now than you had back then? Okay, now think about the knowledge you had back then. Did you make kind of the best decision you knew how based on your circumstances? Mm, yes and no. Yeah, yes and no. You probably knew you were doing something dumb, but where you were in life? Yeah. But today, with more knowledge, with more hindsight, with more understanding... You look back and go, I would never make that decision again. I'd make a different decision. But here's how we judge ourselves. We look backwards and judge ourselves on our current knowledge 
and condemn ourselves for the decision we made back then when we didn't have that knowledge. So if you were a kid and had trouble, what you do is you take your adult knowledge and you say, that kid should have done X, Y, and Z. Because you're looking at that kid as if he were an adult, had adult eyes and adult experiences. Well, that's not true. I have that problem. You know, Lisa and I talk about this all the time. The, the inner child they talk about, I hate that kid. Just hate that kid. She's shaking her head. Oh, but I do. I don't like that kid. But I look at him through my eyes. I don't look him at, at like a six-year-old or a ten-year-old for what he knew and what he experienced. I look him through my eyes and go, that kid, he sucked. <laughs> and I have to work on that. Well, this is part of forgiving yourself. You can't look at the decisions you made, which were probably bad decisions, and go, wow, I'm going to judge myself based on what I know now on that situation, or my circumstances now based on that situation, because I should have known better and I should have X, Y, and Z. And that's not true. You were in a moment. You made a decision based on what you knew at that moment. You may have known the right answer but chosen the wrong path. Now you know not to choose wrong paths because you're, you know, you're working on your faith and you're counseling and all that kind of stuff. Great. But back then, you, you did what you did. And sometimes you have to understand that if God's forgiven you, who are you not to forgive you? Do you really think you're bigger than God? No. Right? And so the forgiving yourself piece is so important. Because you can forgive everyone in the world, be the most loving and graceful person there is, most merciful person there is, and hate yourself. And hate yourself. And that's not God's plan for you. God's plan of forgiveness is forgiving yourself, forgiving those things you made decisions on based upon your knowledge at the time, your experiences at the time, the circumstances at the time, and you had to make a decision and you made the wrong one. Okay, we dust ourselves off. We stand back up, we learn, and we drive forward. Now, this is not just Tom saying this. In the Bible, think about Bible stories. How many of them screwed up before they were used by God? Just say everyone. Oh. <laughs> right? All our heroes. All, if, you go, if you go to Hebrews 11 and you look at the heroes of the faith, they're all screw-ups. And God used every single one of them. Right? I'm a screw-up, believe me. I, I struggle every day. I, I, I have the, the same fights you guys do. And if anybody says they don't, they're a liar. We all have the same fight. Or they're so blinded by Satan that they're, they're clueless. But God loves you so much that he doesn't want you to live in this unforgiveness of your past. The past is past. And how I know that is Scripture says that Paul was talking about when you've got your hands on the plow and you're going forward, you don't look back. You know what happens if you look back and the plow's going forward? <laughs> you drive like I do. And uh, uh, you don't get a straight path. To keep on the straight path, we don't worry about what's behind us. We dust ourselves off. We forgive ourselves for maybe not having the knowledge or making a bad decision based upon the circumstances at the time. Being emotional, because we make bad decisions when we're emotional, right? But we've all learned and we grow. And this fourth piece of forgiveness, this fourth leg, you have to have resolution with yourself. And you have to understand that God's justice to you is mercy. Mercy. He wants so badly to give you mercy. But you have to accept it. And a lot of us don't. Because we think we should be pile-drived into the ground for what we did. And I'm telling you, that's just not our God. That's just not the Jesus I know. And so I want to leave you with this idea. I want to kind of sum it up this way. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Forgiving is a command, not a suggestion. It's very hard to forgive someone. However, if you feel as if there is no resolution or justice in the situation, you can't get there. Always remember that we forgive because God forgives us and that our forgiveness of others is between God and us. And also don't forget that not only do we do you forgive others as well as seek forgiveness, you must forgive God and especially forgive yourself. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.